Mary, did you know that your baby boy would one day walk on water? Mary, did you know that your baby boy would save our sons and daughters? Did you know that your baby This child that you delivered will soon deliver you. Mary, did you know that your baby boy would give sight to the blind man? Mary, did you know that your baby storm with his hand didn't you know that your baby boy has walked where angels try and when you kiss your little baby you kiss the face of God of man Our lesson tonight will be presented by our pastor, Pastor Brown. Hear ye him. Amen. Amen. I said amen. He's coming. If you can get this volume back on. We reverence God and we thank him for this another day and another privilege and honor to come together and to share in the study of the word. This is our lesson for Christmas Day, December 25th, and it's lesson four in this series. And thank you to Brother Superintendent and all of you who have participated in our devotional uh, session tonight. We praise God for the, uh, the uh, opportunity we have to come together. Mary rejoices. Mary rejoices and this is Luke 1 46 through 55 listen to the word of the Lord and Mary said my soul doth magnify the Lord and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior for he hath gathered the low estate of his handmaiden for behold from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. For he that is mighty had done to me great things, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. He had showed strength with his arm. He had gathered a uh, scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He had put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. He had filled the hungry with good things and the rich he had sent empty away. He has opened his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. As he spake to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever. This is Mary's song of praise to God. We're going to explore the two parts of this uh, song, worshiping the Almighty and exalting him by uh, recognizing and acknowledging the work of the Almighty. We're dealing with tonight, and I guess a great question is, what is your reaction if God does something great in your life? What is 
reaction. If God does something unbelievable in your life, will it resort in your bragging about how blessed you are? Or will it result in directing praise, honor, and thanks toward God and his work? What, what will be the result of God doing, doing great things in your life? Two of the four New Testament Gospels tell the story of Jesus' birth. Of course, the most extended uh, revelation of this story is in Luke his gospel. And of course, we know Matthew addresses it and he brings in the, the magi, the, the uh, wise men coming from the east, which is not found in Luke. Matthew's account emphasizes the story of Jesus' birth from the perspective of Joseph. Luke's account is from the perspective of Mary. And Luke's narrative begins with Gabriel, the angel, after he had appeared to Zechariah. Six months later, it appears, he appears to Mary, proclaiming that she was highly favored and blessed among women. Though she was a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Gabriel proclaimed that Mary's son would be called the son of the highest and would someday rule as king. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 through 7. And though Mary questioned Gabriel's promises, she identified herself as a servant of the Lord. She submitted to God's will. However unexpected or seemingly unrealistic his will might have been, she submitted. She yielded herself. And after she received Gabriel's message, she visited her kinsman, her relative, Elizabeth as in verses 39 through 40. During that visit, Elizabeth proclaimed that Mary and the fruit of her womb would be blessed. And there's another part. It says that the spirit uh, leaped, that the baby leaped and the spirit leaped into her. This unlikely virgin received blessings because she believed that God would fulfill the promises that he had made to her. Let me ask you, do you think God knew what kind of person he was choosing when he decided to choose Mary? Gabriel declares she's highly favored. Amen. And I hear people saying that a lot today, highly favored and all that. But I, I don't read nowhere else in scripture where anybody else was identified as highly favored like Mary was. Amen. In response to Gabriel's promise and Elizabeth's blessing, Mary worshiped God. Though not explicitly described as a song in scripture, Mary, uh, uh, many of those who study this scripture acknowledge that this is a song of praise. And in fact, it's called the Magnificat. The Magnificat, which is the title of the first line of this Latin version of this particular text. So scripture shares with us several songs of praise from God's people. Songs give glory to God for who he is and what he has done for them. The songs of Moses in Exodus 15, the song of Miriam in Exodus 15, at the crossing the Red Sea, the, the song of Deborah and Borak, of Barak in Judges 5, the songs of Asaph, 1 Chronicles 16, and the song of Simeon, which we're going to read 
that is all written, that's spelled out in the second chapter of the gospel of Luke. We also read about the prayer of Hannah in first chapter of Samuel, uh, chapter, I mean, first Samuel chapter two. And this lifts up themes similar to Mary's songs. Hannah prayed, followed her request that Lord remember and not forget. Don't forget her by giving her a son. That would be the evidence that he didn't forget her prayer. And she became pregnant and gave birth to Samuel. Hannah dedicated him to the Lord and prayed a word of thanksgiving to God. Hannah's prayer rejoices in God's power and might. And in his concern for the poor and needy, as this lesson unfolds, Mary's song will echo these themes with an extra inclusion regarding the all-encompassing aspect of God's salvation. Our scripture says that Mary said, my soul doth magnify the Lord. And again, that word magnificat to magnify the song of Mary begins with her worship of God for his greatness. And our God is a great God. Her soul included the non-physical part of her person, the invisible part that continues even after a person's physical death. My soul, my soul, the magnify the Lord. Mary's whole being praise God. Some people praise him with the dance, other praise him with the hand clap, some praise him with the song, but she said, my soul, my whole being, every fiber in me, give him praise. To magnify the Lord means to honor his name give thanks for his works. And I wonder how many of us on this line tonight can magnify the Lord, honor his name, and give him thanks for his works in their life. Mary honored God and praised him because of the revelation she received regarding her pregnancy. She likely did not yet know exactly how God would work through her child. All she had on which to base her worship were Gabriel's promises and Elizabeth's blessings. The only validation that she had was her kinsman, Elizabeth, identifying her as being the one that God has chosen. Mary knew she was a favorite part of God's plan. No matter how that plan would come to pass, as a result, she praised God. And all of us as children of God, we ought to recognize that God has chosen us. And we ought to praise him for that. He didn't have to choose you. I don't think nobody on this line can say I'm worthy. I deserve this. It's the grace of God. Verse 47 said, my spirit had rejoiced in God, my Savior. By way of parallelism, this verse repeats the intent of the previous verse. The practice of referring to both a person's soul and spirit was common in Hebrew writings. Job did it. Isaiah did it. Though there are subtle differences between the two, Readers should not become distracted. Every part of Mary magnified and rejoiced in the Lord God. During the New Testament era, era powerful military figures and pagan gods were proclaimed to be saviors of people. The Old Testament, however, uses the title to refer to God of Israel. God is called Savior because of his works of deliverance. 
Mary acknowledged that the deliverance she desired would not come from a military leader or pagan God. Instead, the one true God who had rescued the people of Israel would be her Savior. And my spirit have rejoiced in God, my Savior. All people can receive the Savior's salvation when they respond according to the biblical plan of salvation. God's greatness, my brothers and sisters, evokes joy and gladness among his people. God and his plan will not fail, and so his people can depend on him. Ah, I can depend on God. You need not fear when the Lord is on your side. They celebrate the worship and worship him as the one who brings salvation. For he hath regarded the low estate of his handmaid. This verse provides Mary reason for praising God as her savior. She glorified her savior who saw her in her place of lowliness. The song portrays God as a king who looks on his lowliest subjects and still regards them with favor. Mary's low estate was because of her position in the world. She was a young woman. She was unmarried. Here she is pregnant. Her hometown is a little town that had a bad reputation. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? The Lord looked way down. He reached way down to a place like Nazareth. And he sought out a girl of low estate who identified herself as a handmaid, servant. And there they were, they, were, they were held in low regard by other Jews being from Nazareth. Her ancestors had a history of living under foreign rule. By the world standard, Mary resided in a state of insignificance. But what's insignificant to men can be significant to God. An attitude, look y'all, of humility can be found in the people whom God chooses to use. Humble yourself. Jesus describes himself as meek and lowly in heart. And in Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, we talked about, come unto me, all ye that labor, and I have it laid, and I will give you rest. His followers are called to a life of humility. God promised to lift up the humble and the lowly and offer them grace. When his people live in humility, they can be attentive to his call. Some people live in too high on the hog, as they used to say. They're living too lavishly. They're living with the substances of the earth to the point that they don't know their need for God. As a handmaiden of the Lord, Mary placed herself in obedience to him. She pledged to follow the Lord's commands so that his promises might be fulfilled in and through her. I wonder if we have decided I want the Lord's will to be done through me. Whatever you have to do to humble me and put me in a state where I can be responding in the right way to your will for my life. God's people are not servants ignored or mistreated. Instead, his people are the recipients of his favor and blessing. It's an honor to be a servant of God. It's an honor to humble yourself, humble yourself in the presence of God. Verse 48b says, for behold, from henceforth, all generations shall call me blessed. 
I may be low now. I may be insignificant now. But God is working. He's working something out that's going to turn my life around. Future generations would call Mary blessed, not because of her own efforts, but because of the ways that the Lord used her. She gave birth to Jesus, the one who brings blessings to all generations. Though Mary's proclamation came to pass, all people can be considered blessed by God when they hear the word of God and keep it. When they humble themselves as willing servants, she call us a handmaid, as willing servants. For he that is mighty has done to me great things. Throughout scripture, God's people proclaim his might and they worship him. God shows his might by working great things for his people. These works involve the redeeming of his people from slavery, saving them from oppression, in response, God's people experience gladness and should respond with worship and obedience through his mighty power. God worked exceptionally in Mary when she gave birth to Jesus, the son of the most high God. And Mary goes on to say, and holy is his name. A person's name sometimes refers to an attitude of that person. Mary knew that God is holy. So she proclaimed his name to be the same. God's holiness speaks to his moral perfection. Although humans commit sin, God cannot. He is at all times morally pure and upright. He desires that his people Practice holiness as well. And if you want to get people quiet, start talking about holiness and practicing holiness in this corrupt society in which we are. Verse 50 says, and his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. Mary previously proclaimed how God did a mighty work to me she says. In this verse, the song changes focus and tell of God's mercy to them. The people who fear and follow God, the almighty God shows his love toward his people when they come to him with humility and keep his commandments. When the people live in this manner, they have knowledge of his work and his blessings. Experiences of God's mercy are a central theme in the first chapter of Luke's gospel. When people love God and follow his command, he promises his presence and his mercy. God's promise his people so that they can endure. He, his promises will not fail from generation to generation of his people if they are faithful and if they humble themselves, God will keep his promises. The second portion of this lesson is the work of the Almighty. God has already showed us that he is mighty, that he is awesome. He has showed strength with his arm, verse 51 says, he has scattered the proud in the imaginations of their heart. Though God is a spirit, scripture frequently describes his attributes in terms of human characteristics. And that's identified in uh, theological doctrine as anthropomorphism, attributing human traits or human behavior to a God that is a spirit. The arm of God describes his might 
and control in the world. Mary proclaimed God's might, but his strength would also be directed toward people who exalt themselves. Amen. Look at God in contrast to the people who fear God and follow his commands are the proud people. Because of their pride, these people disregard God and disregard his authority. But I want you to know he can bring them down. They rely on their own ability. They rely on their own power. They rely on their own name to find success in the world's eyes. The scripture lists pride as a sin found in people who refuse to follow God. God resisted the proud and given grace to the humble. He does not tolerate prideful people. He promises to punish them for their sin. Mary's song portrays prideful people as God's enemies. He would strike down the proud and scatter them in defeat. Not only is pride evident in a person's actions, but it can also be found in their hearts. The Greek word behind imagination can also refer to a person's mind and understanding. Prideful people express arrogance through their actions and in their hearts and in their minds. You ought to pray. You have to pray for pride not to swell up in you. Because God don't, like one thing, being proud is really a lie. None of us have anything to be proud of. And I'll take it back to the lowest denominator. Nobody woke themselves up this morning. Nobody cared for their own mind while they were asleep. Nobody was able to restore themselves. It was God. So why are you proud? What, I, what do you have to be proud of? You ought to be thankful. You ought to be grateful. And you ought to humble yourself. Verse Amen. 52 said, he has put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. You don't have to worry about people who think they the greatest. Yeah. Let me say this. I know a lot of people don't believe this, but when we were watching the Ed Sullivan show, and y'all know how long that's been off. That's quite a while. And I heard the Beatles say that we're more famous than Jesus Christ. I turned to my wife. I said, they're on their way down. They're on their way down. And I did the same thing with Michael Jackson. And something he said. And something that was said about, it. look, I don't want nobody trying to boost and boast me up to the point where God think I'm trying to be prideful. Amen. I'm grateful. I'm grateful for what he Dr. has Brown. done, what he has allowed me to do. Yes, ma'am. When you speak of pride, uh, many times our children will do things, uh, positive things, uh -huh. and we tell them we're proud of them. Yeah. Should we refrain from doing that? No. No, that's not what I'm talking about. No, we ought to show them that we are proud and grateful for them. But we ought not want them to, re to forget. See, God allowed you to do it. God gave you this talent. God gave you this ability. God is with you. And I am so proud of you that you have humbled yourself and allow God to use you and use your talent and use your skill. You can give them that sense of worth without making them think that they did it all by themselves. Do, do you understand what I'm saying now? Yes, I do. Did you have any other questions you understand? I want to make sure you're no, clear no. on that. And, uh, and ain't, ain't, ain't nothing wrong with you saying, look what the Lord has done. 
I don't see any problem. Look what the Lord has done. And don't be boastful about yourself. Amen. But be boastful about the God you serve. Now, the, the, the thing with humility, I tell people when people, when you start telling people that you're humble, you're not. <laughs> the fact that you said that. So humility uh, 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 is, is something that once you think you have it, you just lost it. My God. <clears throat> it is a state of being. Not a state of saying. Any other questions on that pride issue? He has put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. Mighty rulers in the world frequently show pride when they appeal to their own power and authority. These rulers fail to recognize the true source of their power. The God who removeth kings, the God who setteth up kings. When prideful people fail to acknowledge God as the one who allows and or provides their authority and influence, God can, and most of the time God will, put them down from their sheets of power. Nebuchadnezzar said, it's not this the Babylon that I built with the power of, thy, of my might. The angel of God came and said, oh, king, don't say that. God has chosen you to use you. Oh, A year later, on the same balcony, <laughs> overlooking the same work, he declared, is not this the Babylon that I built with the power of my might? And the scripture said he went crazy. He lost his mind. Some say it was seven months, but I believe it was seven years because his fingernails grew like claws and hair grew like feathers. And he ate the grass out on the ground. And at the end of that period, the scriptures say his mind came back. And the first thing he said, there is a God. My God. There is Ooh. a God. He appoints you, he will, mm -hmm. to rule over the affairs of men. Don't ever think that you are independent of God. We all are dependent on God. And there's nobody so high. That God can't bring them down. The God, the same God who bring down proud and mighty rulers also shows concern for the people whom the world would consider to be of low degree. Yes, sir. You already know this, but here it is. God exalt who he wants. Amen. And he leave them there as long as he wants. He don't care what you think about it. God brings down who he desires to bring down. I heard one preacher say, if God fire you, won't nobody hire you. <laughs> <laughs> and no matter how competent and how qualified you are, if God said, I can't use you, can't nobody put in a word to change God. God has exalted the humble by promising them grace. James 4 and 6. Mary sang this promise because she experienced these promises on herself. A poor girl in a poor community with an unrecognized name or even family name established as highly recognizable. God skipped over the palace in Jerusalem, bypassed the mansions on the hill, and went down to a little town called Nazareth. 
and found a girl that was engaged but not married and decided he liked what he saw. And he made her the most blessed woman, highly favored among women. One part of God's work in the world is to debase the proud. Oh, he can bring them down while providing salvation and elevation. Let me add that to the humble. Verse 53 says, he has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent empty away. The scripture describes how God provided for his people in their moments of need. In the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve sinned, God provided. In the wilderness, when the children of Israel was wandering, God provided. And even by providing land itself. When Abraham was promised a nation, but had no land, God provided. God filled the needs of his people because of his mercy and salvation. The hungry will have sustenance because God will provide. And our full parents had more confidence in God than a lot of us do. A lot of us living lives that they would have dreamed of. And we yet are complaining. But our full parents didn't have sometimes the next week's provisions. But they kept on praising and kept on given glory to God. They wrote songs like the Lord will make a way somehow. People still experience hunger and poverty today. Mary's song looked forward to the day when those who hunger will be filled and will hunger no more. The song served as a warning when the rich and the powerful refuse to care for others and instead focus on their accumulation of wealth they are sent empty away. God's kingdom does not make room for such selfish and prideful people. He has opened his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. Throughout the Old Testament, Israel was identified as servant of the Lord. As such, the people of Israel had a special role in God's plan of salvation, they would be a light to the Gentiles. Out of them, the light of God's salvation would shine for the whole world. Mary was confident that the prophetic implication of her song would be fulfilled because of God's history of remembering his promises. And you need to know God remembers his promises. God's plan was not to forget Abraham's descendants. Instead, his plan was to reveal the way of salvation through them. Mary's song reflects the heart of the psalmist. God had remembered his mercy and his truth toward the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of God. God showed help toward his people. He has hope in us. He has helped us. In the advent of Jesus Christ, our help was on the way. Though the people had disregarded God and his command, God still showed them mercy. God still provided a way for their salvation as well as for the salvation of the world. And he spake to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. Mary's song makes an appeal to the patriarchs, the fathers of Israel. The promises of God spake to Abraham would be fulfilled by way of Mary's child. God promised Abraham that his family would be a blessing to all the earth. Through Mary's child and Abraham's descendant, the promise of blessing has arrived. This was not a new work of salvation by God, but a continuation, a continuation 
of the promise that he had already made. Today's scripture reminds us of the futility of self-exaltation. It's dangerous to brag when you know God did it. If you're going to brag, brag on God. God will choose whom he wants to work through regardless of the world's perception of that person. God don't need your approval to determine who he's going to use to get his work done. Self-exaltation will not lead to salvation. In fact, it will lead to person, a person to emptiness and an existence without God's salvation. We have a choice. Self-examination over self-exaltation. Whenever God has been good to you, you ought to examine yourself. And you ought to give him glory. God's salvation lifts the lowest to the highest degree. No wonder Mary sang a song, a song of praise. And I believe every one of us on here tonight can sing a song of praise for the greatness of God in our lives. Ooh, hallelujah. Is there any, are there any questions? Are there any questions on the lesson tonight? Brother Superintendent, that's what I have for the lesson. Mary, did you know? Ooh, ooh, the blind will see. the grave.